Most people take their fridges for granted, but life would be very different without them. <clears throat> Probably the earliest record of artificial cooling comes from ancient Egypt, where there are records of slaves being employed to fan earthenware pots. That was the same idea as this, the earthenware milk cooler. You put water in the uh, dish down below, and that keeps this cover wet, and it's the evaporation of the water that cools the milk inside. The other method of cooling things, used extensively in ancient Rome, was simply to collect snow. Using a bit of insulation, it can last a surprisingly long time without melting. Romans not only cooled their wine, but they also made ice cream. By the 19th century, various other liquids had been discovered that evaporated much faster than water, like alcohol. If I dab some on my hand, the cooling effect is quite noticeable. It's evaporating so fast, my hand's almost dry already. And this produces even more rapid evaporation. It had been discovered that various gases, when they're compressed, can condense into liquids. And in fact, the, this is carbon dioxide in the cylinder. And under pressure, it's actually a liquid at room temperature. If I uh, re open the valve, it'll shoot out of this pipe and evaporate very rapidly back to a gas. And the cooling effect is quite dramatic. <laughs> You can see the black pipe has now gone all white because it's covered in frost. If this gas was collected and compressed again, it could be condensed back to a liquid and a sort of cycle could be established. And this is exactly the principle of the modern fridge. The liquid under pressure escapes through the restriction valve. As it evaporates to a gas, the pipes get very cold. The gas is piped back to a pump where it gets compressed and heated. The hot gas then cools and condenses back to a liquid, still under pressure. The cycle then starts all over again. The first patent for a machine like this was granted in 1834 to Jacob Perkins. At the time, Perkins' invention was not greeted with much interest because there was already a well-established natural ice industry. Ice was cut from the lakes in America on a vast scale. By 1890, it was harvesting 25 million tonnes a year. Britain imported over half a million tonnes, partly from America and partly from Norway. It was stored in giant wooden ice houses where it could last all summer. This ice was delivered about twice a week by the icemen they put it into these uh, domestic ice boxes. <clears throat> the ice went in the top and the food goes in the bottom. The ice slowly melted and ended up in a drip tray which had to be emptied every day or two. Well, the natural ice industry was well established in Europe and in America, but in Australia, the winters weren't really cold enough to produce much ice. In 1837, James Harrison emigrated from Glasgow to Australia. He became a journalist, but his real obsession was refrigeration. Oh, dear. I cannot concentrate. It's too hot. If only I had a wee machine to make ice. Aye. His first machine didn't work, which he blamed on inferior colonial workmanship. He then went to England and persuaded a Dr. Seabee to make one, based on Perkins' design. 
By 1858, Harrison had brought Seabee's machine back to Australia. Here's my machine, and here you see a perfect lump of ice. Oh. Harrison was then commissioned by a brewery to build a commercial refrigeration plant. So cooling Australian lager was the first practical use of an artificial refrigeration machine in the world. Ice factories soon opened up in England in competition with the natural ice warehouses. The Lowestoft Ice Company was one of the first, as David Forster remembers. The ice company originally began in 1898, and it was my great-grandfather, Mr W. F. Cockrell, who decided that ordinary ice from the glaciers, the Norwegian glaciers, uh, wasn't sufficient for good quality ice, so he decided to make artificial ice using ammonia refrigerant, which happened to come on the market in the 1870s, 1890s. Water is placed in the ice moulds, which are then lowered into the giant brine tank. The circulating brine is cooled by pipes full of the ammonia refrigerant to about minus 10 degrees centigrade. The brine tank is vast, the size of a public swimming pool. After a few days, the water in the moulds has fully frozen and is ready for use. To extract the ice, the moulds are first transferred to a bath of warm water to loosen them. Although this process looks very impressive, today there are much quicker and cheaper methods of making ice. Block ice is now really obsolete, and this is actually the last lift. It's rather sad to see the last lift. It's on the floor there. These are the last blocks that are ever These are the last blocks, the actually, the, the very last blocks. It's a very old-fashioned way of making ice, and it's not really very viable nowadays. This is the engine room of the ice factory. And it's uh, basically a series of uh, large motors and compressors where the ammonia is compressed that provides the refrigeration to cool the brine tanks. The modern domestic refrigerator is exactly the same in principle with uh, an electric motor and a compressor, obviously much smaller. But there was a gap of about uh, 30 years between developing these large ones and making something that was practical enough to put in a kitchen. Th these have quite a few problems. They leak, there are glands and valves on them, and also they're very smelly. The whole place smells strongly of ammonia. The General Electric Company of America decided that the best solution was to enclose the motor and the compressor in a single airtight container. Their first model appeared in 1926, and they advertised it as being so utterly reliable, so utterly dependable, that we've been able to enclose all the moving parts in walls of steel. And it is rather a handsome contraption. The shape of this fridge was designed by the refrigeration engineers themselves. Here it's being demonstrated by Betty Davis in 1935. Good morning. Good morning. My dear, why didn't you wake me up? Oh, there's nothing to do, really. And people quarrel with the inconvenience of living so far out. It's really been the most delightful weekend I've had in years. I wouldn't live anywhere else. 
By the 1950s, specialist industrial designers and stylists had been brought in. They changed their fridge's appearance every year or so to keep in fashion and to present a sophisticated image. And behind the separate refrigerator door, brand new for 57, scientifically planned illumination in the interior. Not just one light to light the upper area, but two to give full illumination across the top, and then a third light to light the lower shelf area. Simply take the handy tray and place it in the ice ejector. Then pull down on the handle. That's all. No pushing, no shoving. Simple, effortless. The handle does all the work for you. Ice cubes in a basket. Just like that. And cubes always stay separate and free from each other. It's new, it's exclusive for 1957. And how's this for convenience? The new juice can dispenser that drops a new can in place as soon as you remove one. As handy, as convenient as the frozen food package dispenser alongside. Remove one package and another is ready for instant use. For more features to demonstrate, it's the Imperial 121 for 1957. The modern fridge really is exactly the same as this one. It looks a bit different because the pipes and the motor and the compressor are now rather more discreetly put at the back of the fridge, the motor down here and the pipes up the top. Here we've cut the pipework circuit out of a modern fridge. This is the ice box, which is also the evaporator coil, pressed out of two sheets of aluminium. This is the sealed unit that contains the motor and, and compressor and the hot gas comes out here and it's cooled and condensed back to a liquid in these pipes at the back. Well, you can't actually see what's going on inside the evaporator. So Rex and I built this model in which we've replaced the evaporator by this glass jar. This is the liquid going into the evaporator here. and it's evaporating inside the jar and returning to the, com to the compressor as a gas. I can feel the, the jar getting cold and the coils at the back are getting quite hot. The flow is controlled by this valve, just like the valve on the carbon dioxide cylinder. And in fact, early fridges had valves just like that, but we've been having great trouble to get the setting on the valve right it tends to freeze up completely. In modern fridges, the valve has been replaced by a fine capillary tube. This has the same effect of restricting the flow. And to stop it freezing up, the tube runs up alongside the warmed gas coming back down again into the compressor. Various gases have been tried as refrigerants, but most were too toxic, corrosive or inflammable. Carbon dioxide itself is nearly ideal, but it has a rather strange property. It, uh, change, it sometimes can change directly from a gas to a solid, which I think we can show you with uh, this setup here. Um, if we can hold that off for that, if you turn it on. so-called dry ice. It's very useful stuff. It's used for keeping things cold and it's also used theatrically for creating effects of mist when it's usually put into hot water. But it wouldn't be much good as a refrigerant because the solid could keep blocking up the pipes.
Today, most refrigerants are fluorocarbons. These are the same as the chemicals that are used as propellants in aerosol cans. They're ideal, except for the hole they're making in the ozone layer. There are only a few ounces in each fridge, but there are a lot of fridges in the world, and all the fluorocarbon escapes whenever a fridge is scrapped. We've cut the weld off this sealed unit so that you can see what's inside. Most of it is really the motor. It all sits on these three springs, which reduce the noise, and it sits in a puddle of oil, so that even on an old fridge, the whole thing looks almost brand new. <clears throat> Outside, the motor is connected to a bit of electrical gear. There's one device that gives the motor an extra kick to start it up, and another device to stop it if it gets too hot. The uh, compressor itself is a really little tiny lump that fits on the end. If I turn the motor around, I think you can see the piston going up and down. It's all very solidly made, because in the life of a fridge, it goes round several thousand million times. Inside, there are two reed valves, which let the refrigerant in one side and out the other. On this model, if we start it up, start the compressor going, you can see the piston flies up and down at a fair rate, and the refrigerant comes in one side and is pushed out the other side. Fridge compressors have a variety of other uses. They're often used for, as compressors for airbrushes, and they're even used by dentists sometimes connected to the pipe that sucks the saliva out of your mouth. Compressors and compressed air actually have all sorts of uses. This capsule gun works entirely on compressed air. I made it a few years ago to uh, simulate bullet hits for films and TV. It's by necessity a bit complicated. The mechanism inside is a real plumber's nightmare. Here you've got a reciprocating cylinder which actually drives the bolt forwards and backwards. Um, when the charge, the capsule is put inside the breech and it goes to the full extremity forward, it fires compressed air down the barrel. It fires many types of capsule. This one is a blood capsule and it would simulate a blood hit. And of course, these little fellows which are actually explosive capsules, and they give us a shower of sparks and a mild explosion when they hit. Meanwhile, back inside the fridge, the compressor is pumping the refrigerant round, but it still needs something to turn it on and off at the right temperature. It does this with this fine tube full of a liquid. The liquid expands as the temperature rises, and that pushes out this small bellows at the end. got one of these thermostat switches set up on the this model here if I hold the end to raise the temperature um, the bellows will expand and at some point the contacts on top will flick over and the compressor will start up <clears throat> sometimes takes a little while perhaps it's not going to do it ah. Well, of course, the thermostat switch also has a dial on it to adjust the temperature that the compressor comes on. It does this by moving the contact arm. The closer the arm to the bellows, the less the bellows has to expand to flick the switch. Thermostat switches have hundreds of uses, wherever something needs turning on or off at a particular temperature. This is a water clock I built a few years ago with a friend. On the hour, water is released from a tank on the roof, and this starts it all working. It was important to stop the water freezing on the way down, so we fitted this thermostat to turn everything off whenever the temperature falls too low. That completes the basic fridge mechanism, but without a thick layer of insulation, all the cold would quickly be lost.
This fridge has a blanket of fiberglass, just like roof insulation. Old fridges used to have massive door handles and massive hinges that could apply a large closing force. <clears throat> and this squashed the rubber seal all round the door into contact with the frame. To apply enough force, the whole fridge had to be very strongly made. An elephant weighing over four tons was to stand on top of this new Frigidaire. And it must not show any signs of strain under this tremendous load. Will it take it? Can this new Frigidaire stand up under such terrific punishment? Those were the questions that flashed through everyone's mind. But look, our elephant isn't in doubt. And as he cautiously but firmly places each foot on top of the Frigidaire, it is proved without a question of doubt, that this new frigid air cabinet is a real masterpiece of construction. Yes, gentlemen, here is a cabinet so sturdy, so strong, that the door can be opened and closed while it supports this tremendous load of over four tons. In modern fridges, there's a flexible magnetic strip inside the rubber seal. You can sometimes see the seal pulling itself against the door frame just after you close the fridge. Here we've cut one of these seals out of a modern fridge and uh, I can pull the magnetic strip out just to prove it's magnetic. This has made it unnecessary for fridges to have such massive handles and hinges. In fact, the whole casing can now be much less substantial. When I was repairing domestic appliances for a living, one of the most common faults I come across on fridges was an ill-fitting door seal. There's an easy way to check whether the door seal is actually gripping the cabinet or not, and that's to drop in a piece of paper, which should be quite a tight, locked fit. And here, as you can see, there's a gap. Now, there's quite an easy way of repairing this, which was rather embarrassing when you was in a customer's house, uh, because the first thing to do was to get the customer out of the kitchen because the only way to repair it satisfactorily was brute force. So you used to very subtly ask her for the guarantee or something like that, so she went away to look at it, and then you repaired it by merely putting your foot against the bottom and pulling like blazes, and you'll find that the door then fits. As you can see, that's grip. And of course, most people wouldn't like things like that done to their refrigerator. The most inadequate and flimsy parts of a modern fridge must be the doors. The plastic cracks up. The bottle stays pop out. And the icebox door has to take an, an immense strain every time you try and open it when the thing's iced up. <clears throat> In fact, I suspect that broken doors are the most common reason why fridges are thrown away. But perhaps I'm being too critical. A recent witch survey found that fridges were about the most reliable of our household machines. And certainly every single one of the fridges that we got for this program from the scrapyard was still in working condition. It has been said that the weakest part of all machines and computers is their interface with the outside world. And the idea of enclosing all the moving parts of a fridge as a single airtight unit has not only stopped all the leaks, but it's also produced a machine that has a quite unusual degree of reliability. Just think how many times a year your fridge has to turn on and off. The front of your fridge may be cheap and nasty, but I hope the next time you look at the back of your fridge, you'll regard it with suitable admiration. <laughs>